On a cold autumn night, a Soviet destroyer, the Sentry, set sail from Riga Harbor. On board, an extraordinary mutiny was taking place. The ship's commander had been locked up. His second-in-command had seized control. Half the Baltic fleet was launched to hunt the sentry down. Sixty warplanes were scrambled with direct orders from the Kremlin. Stop or sink the ship. The sentry's crew was defenseless, their ammunition stores empty. But the man who led them to mutiny would not be intimidated. He wanted nothing less than the overthrow of his country's leaders. The true story of what happened on board the sentry was suppressed by the KGB. Until the end of the Cold War, Western intelligence believed the ship's crew had been trying to defect. The story inspired a Hollywood blockbuster, The Hunt for Red October, starring Sean Connery. But the sentry was no nuclear submarine, and her renegade captain was a very unusual type of dissident. A devoted communist, Deputy Commander Valery Sablin would never have contemplated defection as his protest. His aim was to lead a bloodless revolution against the Soviet state. Twenty-five years after the events that changed their lives, members of the Sentry's crew gather for the first time. Most still won't talk about their experiences as teenage conscripts, but those who do share a deep affection for Valery Sablin. In 1975, the submarine hunter, the Sentry, was among the most modern ships in Russia's Baltic fleet. Her second-in-command, Valery Sablin, seemingly on the verge of a brilliant career. The Russian Navy was the pride and joy of Soviet leader Leonid Brezhnev. But the admiration was far from mutual. Brezhnev. By 1975, despite all the propaganda, Brezhnev wasn't really respected. I won't say everyone felt like that, but the naval officer corps certainly did. The Kremlin geriatrics in the Politburo with Brezhnev at their head, were never going to lead the country to prosperity, let alone true communism, in which Sublin believed. Sublin had joined the century as captain third rank in 1973, serving under commander Anatoly Potulny. It was a prestigious appointment for a 34-year-old officer especially since Sablin also held the rank of chief political commissar. The crew thought very highly of him. As the ship's political officer, you could confide in him at any time. He was like a priest. As the senior party member on board, Sablin's duties included giving the crew weekly lectures on the prevailing doctrine. 20-year-old rating Alexander Shane was delegated to help Sablin prepare party propaganda. 
Those political classes were a complete mockery. People only went to them to have a kip. We realized that it was all for show, that it was completely insincere. I said to Sablin, what good is this window dressing? When there's a war, how are we going to defend anybody with this meaningless rhetoric? Normally, the political officer would be a much feared official, often an agent of the KGB. But Sablin established a rapport with his men that was too close for his superiors like him. My colleagues and I gave him advice about how to deal with the men. Advice on how to motivate them as individuals and how to organize the party and Komsomol activities on board. But he didn't always go out of his way to carry out to the full orders given to him by his superiors. He had a character all his own, with several idiosyncrasies. He liked to do things on his own terms. Sablin's lectures became increasingly subversive. He would preach revolutionary Leninist doctrines rather than the dictates of Brezhnev's Politburo. He often referred to the Navy's long tradition of rebellion, and particularly the mutiny on the battleship Potemkin. Sublin was probably one of the best informed officers in the Navy. He knew his history, and that in 1975 the country had just celebrated the 70th anniversary of the mutiny on board the Potemkin. Eisenstein's film about the failed uprising in 1905 of a ship's crew against the Tsarist regime had left a deep impression on Sablin. Sablin was continuing Bolshevik revolutionary traditions. He was steeped in those traditions. He was part of the flesh and bone of the party. So his calculations were simple. We will keep faith with a revolutionary tradition that goes back to the battleship Potemkin. In early November 1975, the sentry sailed from her home base on the Baltic to Riga in Latvia. There she would join the naval flotilla to honor the 58th anniversary of the revolution. Sablin decided to seize the opportunity of this most symbolic period in the Soviet calendar. But first, he had to find someone he could trust. On the 5th, we left Baltisk. He called me into the lecture hall. He said to me, Sasha, do you think you could work for the KGB? You know there's talk on board about the party. I was really insulted because we had been working together and I respected him. Now he was suggesting I become an informer. I got carried away. I don't know what kind of state I was in. I was ready to walk out and slam the door. He realized this and said, OK, Sasha, I'm sorry. I was just testing you. Sit down. We need to talk seriously. Only then did Sablin reveal his audacious plan. In three days' time, he wanted to seize control of the sentry and sail her to Leningrad. From the birthplace of the 1917 revolution, the day after its anniversary, he would broadcast a call to the Soviet people to rise up again. Frankly, I was stunned. He told me everything, spelt it all out. And finally, he said, this is the step I want to take. If you want to help me, it's up to you. I was a bit of a rebel. Maybe that's why he chose me.
On the 8th, we went into Riga to take in the sights and then returned to the ship. I had to stay on board as I was on duty. It was such a strange feeling, a sort of tension in the air. There was this eerie silence on board. Everyone came back from shore leave. The commander was in his cabin. Sablin went and knocked on the door and said there were people drinking on duty at post one. Should we go and check? The commander, who was always very diligent, said, what, people boozing on my ship? Let's go and sort it out. He went down to the lower deck into the observation post and Sablin shut the hatch after him and locked it. He gave me one of the duty officer's guns, unloaded, and said, I'm going to call the crew together to watch a film. Let's gather the officers and midshipmen in their mess room, and I'll explain the plan to them. Your task is to back me up and stand by me. The film Sablin chose to inspire his men was inevitably the battleship Potemkin. While they were watching it, Sablin tried to persuade his officers to support his revolt. He proposed we go to St. Petersburg, what was then called Leningrad. He wanted to get on national radio on a frequency that anyone could tune into, with an appeal to the people to really look at their lives. He explained that Leningrad was the cradle of revolutions. People there had a history of uprising. He said all revolutions had begun in Leningrad, and he didn't want to break with this tradition. That's why we had to make the journey. At this moment, Sablin could not have known if any officers would support him. Some were shocked when he revealed that the ship's commander had been locked up. That made everyone nervous. On a ship, the commander is untouchable. Sablin swept any resistance aside and demanded a vote. Medical officer Oleg Sadkov and seven others refused to help him. But eight officers and all the crew pledged their support. From that moment on, there was great enthusiasm. Everyone's spirits lifted. We thought we'd be such heroes. <laughs> Before leaving Riga, Sablin wrote a letter to his wife, Nina, revealing why he had decided to risk everything. Why am I doing this? A love of life. And I mean not in the sense of the life of a comfortable bourgeois, but a bright, truthful life which inspires a genuine joy in all honest people. I am convinced that in our nation, just as 58 years ago in 1917, a revolutionary consciousness will alight, and we will achieve communism in our society. No one could have predicted that Valery Sablin would one day lead a mutiny. Born into a naval dynasty going back three generations, he grew up with a strict sense of discipline and moral values.
Even at school, he had strong principles. You couldn't miss that. He was incapable of lying. When he saw that someone was doing something wrong, he couldn't keep it to himself. He had to speak out. Valeri and his two brothers were all born and brought up on naval bases. It was the only life they knew. His yearning to go to sea was probably a result of our upbringing. We always lived by the sea. We were born there. I wasn't fortunate enough to become a naval officer. Valeri managed it, and he was very proud of that. In 1955, aged just 16, Valery Sablin was accepted into the elite Frunze Academy in Leningrad to train as a naval officer. We were all educated to adhere to the spirit of socialist and communist ethics. We all believed in them. But Valery had such integrity he wanted to put these ideals into action. Even as a young cadet, Sablin was dedicated to the party. He was voted head of the communist youth organization. His school friends called him the conscience of the class. But Sablin's convictions sometimes made him recklessly frank. In 1959, he wrote directly to Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev denouncing the inequalities of society. Party apparatchiks were not amused. He was summoned to the political department and given a real dressing down. I think they even delayed his promotion. He almost ruined his whole career with that letter to Khrushchev. In 1964, Leonid Brezhnev ousted Khrushchev and immediately ordered the expansion of the Soviet fleet to counter the threat from NATO. New opportunities abounded for ambitious young officers like Valery Sablin. In 1969, he was offered the command of a destroyer at the surprisingly young age of 30. But Sablin shocked his family by turning promotion down to further his political education. At first, I couldn't understand this decision. Then later, I realized he wanted to find out all he could about our system of political workers and to understand it from the inside. The Lenin Political Academy, exclusively for military officers, was a finishing school for the party faithful. Here, Sablin set about studying the original architects of communism, not just Lenin and Marx, but Trotsky, Bukharin and others. But living in Moscow with his wife Nina and young son Misha, Sablin could not ignore the manifest injustices of Soviet society under Brezhnev. He saw evidence of corruption all around and was incensed that even the academy's library had been censored. He once complained bitterly to me that all his hopes had been dashed. He thought that students at the academy would be given more privileged access to information and books. He was really upset that, alas, even there, students got an education based on the same stereotypes as everyone else. By the time Sablin joined the century, the seeds of a one-man revolution had been sown. My studies at the academy finally made me realize that the armor of the state and party is so thick that even direct hits won't make a dent. This machine has to be broken from the inside. Valery Sablin's plan 
was to sail the sentry over 500 nautical miles from Riga to Leningrad, from where he would broadcast his revolutionary appeal. But the plan began to unravel before the ship left harbour, when a junior officer escaped to raise the alarm. We either had to surrender or try and do something. I looked at Sablin, who was now hesitating. It was some of the sailors who were saying, come on, now we've started, we might as well see it through. I'd put two life jackets on because I can't swim. I'd gone to lie down somewhere to get some sleep. Suddenly, at about one o'clock in the morning, they sounded battle stations. It was my duty to cast off, so I rushed to the foredeck. We were all running around like lunatics. I was completely confused. I kept asking myself, what's happening here? It's against all the rules, military and naval. What are we doing? I felt like a blind man being led across a minefield. The ship was gathering more and more speed, and this feeling of uncertainty became overpowering. There was a feeling of freedom, a kind of contentment, as though your heart was about to take flight. I looked out and saw a ship emerging from the harbor that I thought was going to block us. The sentry veered sharply to the right, I was nearly thrown overboard. I was just hanging on. It felt as though we were at a 45 degree angle. And this other ship kept coming, and then it suddenly lurched to the left. As the ship left Riga behind, Sablin ordered a tape of his speech to be played on the ship's tannoy and on an open radio frequency. He hoped that his incendiary words would be heard on civilian radios and would incite a people's revolt. Although the alarm had now been raised, the authorities in Riga were slow to respond. Officers on duty were sleeping off the after-effects of anniversary celebrations. Others were simply paralyzed by shock. Once I got the call, I had this feeling of alarm the whole time. Nothing like this had ever happened before. A political officer who'd suddenly seized control of a ship. Now we learn that he'd taken command. He wouldn't deal with us, his direct superiors. He would only deal with Moscow. By now, Sablin had the Politburo's full attention. The Navy's commander-in-chief gave him a direct order, stop the sentry and return to port. 
Sablin refused. Brezhnev was woken in the middle of the night. His advisers warned that Sablin's speech could be a smokescreen that he secretly planned to defect. The Soviet leader was taking no chances. He personally gave the order to his officers in the Baltic, either stop or sink the sentry, regardless of losses. I was suddenly woken up at four in the morning and told there was a car waiting to take me urgently to headquarters. There, Vice Admiral Shadrich gave me my orders. Go to sea and stop the ship. If I couldn't stop her, then I had to destroy her. Thirteen heavily armed Coast Guard vessels were ordered to hunt down the sentry. At daybreak on November the 9th, they caught up with their prey. By dawn, we'd reached the Gulf of Riga, and for the first time I could see the Coast Guard boats. Their commander sent us a message by Morse and loud hailer, telling us to stop or they would open fire. They wanted to know where we were going. We replied by loud hailer that we weren't betraying the motherland and that we were not going abroad. As we sailed on, our resolve was cracking. Some people were having doubts. But there were still enough of us who wouldn't give in. To reach Leningrad and avoid the coastal shallows, Sablin had been steering towards international waters. Now those in pursuit became even more alarmed. Where was the sentry heading? Leningrad or Sweden? I had no idea where she was heading. She never reached the point where I could know for certain the ship was heading for Sweden, because at that very moment, planes from the Baltic Fleet Air Wing appeared over the ship. When I arrived at the command post, my squadron was already airborne. 18 planes, each armed with two missiles. I contacted the squadron leader in the air. The line was clear, and I ordered him to fly over the ship with his missiles primed and to make it plain that he was threatening her. When the planes appeared, it changed everything. It was clear that if we didn't stop, they would bomb us. So I said, prepare to destroy the target. The squadron leader acknowledged. Then there was a pause, as if he'd been knocked unconscious. He couldn't understand how it was possible to sink one of our own ships. Several long, hard minutes passed. Then seconds, and I should have heard the order to fire. Then I realized that they had flown over without opening fire. The pilots had deliberately refused to fire on their colleagues on the sentry. For a brief moment, it seemed to those in charge that the mutiny was spreading. There was all this cursing on the phone from Gretschko, the Minister of Defense, and Gorshkov, the Commander-in-Chief. They 
They were all somewhere at the ministry in Moscow, and they were furious. They were asking me what was going on. Carry out the order immediately. About a kilometer away, we saw the silhouettes of two fighters. They were flying low at about four to six hundred meters. No one said a word, we just looked, and suddenly we heard gunfire. Then we heard an enormous bang from in front of us. We were terrified and went and hid in the toilet at the stern. Then we heard a cracking noise as the hull was ruptured. I peered out and saw an enormous column of water rising up like a dagger. They dropped one of their bombs right on our course. We rushed out again as the planes turned away. One of the lads even thought it was a NATO attack. And then there was another huge explosion at the stern. The ship lurched and started going round in circles, and I felt our speed dropping. Some of the crew ran up and said that they wanted to release the commander. And a few of the old hands went and unlocked the padlock. They opened the hatch and the commander charged out and asked, Where's Sablin? He snatched a Makarov pistol from someone and made for the bridge. We all rushed after him. I saw Sablin calmly looking out of the porthole. He turned around and at that moment the commander shot him in the leg. The commander came on the radio. He was so hoarse I barely recognized him. He said, cease fire, I have regained command of the ship. Less than six hours after the sentry had left Riga, Valery Sablin's mutiny lay in ruins. His ship had been disabled, some of his supporters had turned against him, and he had been shot. Paratroopers came on board with automatic rifles. There were people in civilian dress with them. Then I was taken to the bridge, where I saw Sablin with his leg bandaged. After that, I don't remember anything, because they took me on deck and put me up against a wall. I was standing there for a long time, from 7 a.m. until 6 p.m. They had orders to shoot us in the legs if we moved. On the way back to Riga, one officer asked me, what made you do it? You broke your oath. 
I said, look at the way we live. What sort of life is that? Do you really think people should have to live like this? It's just one big lie. He seemed to agree. Maybe he even sympathized. But he couldn't understand what drove Sablin to do it. In Riga, the KGB took over the investigation, arresting all the sentry's crew and officers, regardless of their sympathies. They demanded silence from everyone involved. Everything was done quietly. We just talked to the men to find out what had happened. People were shocked, of course. The majority of the officers and seamen were badly shaken. They never thought or believed that such a thing could happen on a ship, especially not that a political officer, a commissar, could have carried it out. They asked us to write down a minute-by-minute -minute account of everything that had happened on the ship. They said, take your time. If it takes you two weeks, that's fine. What you saw, who you talked to. So I wrote it down. Everything. For up to four months, the young teenagers who served on the sentry were allowed no contact with the outside world and given no clue as to their punishment. One of my shipmates came from Siberia. He had this sort of gallows humor. He said, don't be scared, lads. If they send us to Siberia, you know the countryside there is a knockout. Even though all of us, aged just 19 or 20, were facing prison, we still put on a brave face. Eventually, the young conscripts were called before a special tribunal of senior officers. All the top brass arrived, Gorshkov, Epichev, more admirals and generals than you could count. They were on a special podium and each of us had to go up there and explain himself. Some of us said we didn't understand, others said they didn't know. They asked, how could you not know if you were doing your job? One guy from the Voloiga region said, I'll never do that again. And all those generals and admirals laughed. And Gorshkov said, so you'd choose another way, would you? And then, when we saw them all smiling, we relaxed. We understood we were forgiven because we were so young. The KGB was less forgiving of those they identified as the ringleaders. Sablin, Shane and 14 others were sent to Moscow's notorious La Fortovo prison. One of the KGB's most experienced interrogators was assigned to question Sablin. Sablin came in on crutches, wearing blue hospital pajamas. One of his legs was in plaster due to the injury he'd received when Commander Patulny regained command of the ship. From that moment, we started work on Sablin. Sablin soon convinced his interrogator that defection had never been his intention. But the truth, that a loyal party official had turned against the state, was a secret the KGB could never allow to become public. They had a ready-made cover story. Defection. It was very convenient for the authorities because Sublin could be disowned and treated like a common criminal or someone who was trying to escape to the West for financial reasons. It was a convenient theory because it reduced the significance of this event. It wasn't a mutiny, it wasn't a riot. 
It was just a regular criminal act. After being questioned every day for nine months, Valery Sablin was eventually charged with betrayal of the motherland. The crime normally carried a 15-year sentence. It was the first time I had seen him since it happened. I walked into the courtroom and he was already there. He gave me this really piercing look, staring straight into my soul as if to say, are you still fighting or have you given up? Then the court was told to rise. The judges came in and read out the sentence. Sublin is sentenced to death by firing squad, and Shane is given eight years. As soon as the death sentence was read out, this chill ran through the courtroom. I was led to believe that the death sentence was decided in a telephone call from the Kremlin. It was Brezhnev's decision to have him executed by a firing squad, and the court simply repeated this. Sablin didn't know about it until the last minute. Not even the investigators knew about it. Only the judges knew. They read it out and started collecting their papers. And Sublin gave them this scathing look, as much as to say, what do you think you're doing? Under this stare, they left the room, and only then did he... I mean, it was a huge shock. He slumped forward onto the barrier, and a guard held him. And that was the last time I saw him. Sablin was allowed to write a final letter in which he addressed his only son. Trust the fact that history will judge events honestly and you will never have to be embarrassed for what your father did. On no account ever be one of those people who criticizes but does not follow through his actions. Such people are hypocrites, weak, worthless people who do not have the power to reconcile their beliefs with their own actions. I wish you courage, my dear. Be strong in the belief that life is wonderful. Be positive and believe that the revolution will always win. Sablin was executed just weeks after his trial. The men who served on the sentry received a variety of punishments. None, apart from Shane, were convicted, but their complicity with Sablin's actions changed all their lives. All our careers were ruined. The state machine ground us all down. The wheels of justice, and just as they were, affected all of us, even the officers, regardless of seniority. We all lost our jobs, our love of the sea, the passion to defend our country. It was all crushed. The machine broke everyone's life. Sablin hoped to inspire a revolution with his words and actions. His actions remained a secret, hushed up by the KGB. And his words, which he hoped would reach the ears of ordinary Soviet people, were fated never to be heard. Although the speech was transmitted, the radio operator did not dare to broadcast it as an open text. So he encoded it as he was trained to. It was only heard in the offices of the senior Navy commanders. No one else heard the address. They didn't let Sublin say a single word. 